you dream of a classroom where learning is natural? Can we inspire students to lifelong learning? What exactly is the purpose of an education? Inspiring students to be curious, independent, creative, innovative, deep thinking, confident, proactive, collaborative, determined, educated. Rise to the challenge of changing the world. This is teaching. This is learning. This is who we are. Welcome to the Tabletop Inventing Podcast. How does one start as a computer programmer and end up as a lawyer? How is a deeper perspective on history related to maker education? What is the difference between seeing the Mona Lisa on a website and seeing it in the Louvre? Stay tuned for today's podcast to hear the answers to these and other burning questions. Hey there, Innovation Nation. Wow, that sounds a little like a car commercial, but I still like the sound of it. We'd like to thank you all this week for listening. I made the mistake this week of watching our rankings in iTunes a little too carefully. In the space of a few days, we went from number 195 in the educational technology category to number 111 to number 108 to number 102. Now, I'm sure that it hit all the numbers in between, but those are the ones that I saw. I'm recording this on Wednesday, and last night when I looked, we were number four. That meteoric rise went to my head because briefly, we hit the overall education category in iTunes, and we're at the number 101 spot. This morning, I've had time to reflect more carefully and think. (laughs) Imagine that. When I checked out our actual download numbers, nothing real seemed to have changed uh, from yesterday or the day before or last week uh, to send us to number four. So I was a little suspicious about the meaning, and while I don't completely understand iTunes metrics, we are now at two in educational technology as of this recording, 78 in the overall education section. Now I'm a physicist and the data never lies. We misinterpret it all the time, but it never lies. And I have a theory. It was a glitch in the iTunes matrix. (laughs) Anyway, whatever the case, we need more listeners like you to join us as we discuss the state of education in America. Now many Americans are simply unaware of the state of education in the U.S. We believe an honest conversation is in order. So we offer the Tabletop Inventing podcast as a conversation starter. We don't have all the answers, but we do ask hard questions. Our interview guests have stepped up to the plate with those hard questions and really knocked it out of the park. So keep listening. Our promise to you is that we will continue to grow and get great interviewers with insights into the challenges and reliable new approaches in education. We got a few new reviews this week, and I'd like to give a shout out to Scott Associates, Rowdy Rhino 77 and to Kim Brand from 3D Parts Indy, who says, Steve's interview style gives his guests plenty of room to make their point and communicate their message. It felt like he was asking the questions I wanted to ask. Wow, that is high praise, Kim Brand. Thank you guys so much for your support and words of encouragement. Today's episode may be a little edgy and irreverent. This is a little bit of a listener advisory again, but I don't think any of us is surprised that a few students make it through the U.S. education system with some scars. Today's guest, Jeff Wiggs, is now a successful attorney in Northern California, but his experience is worth some tough reflection. This is an official listener advisory message. Today's podcast is not for the faint of heart. The material is top-notch, but prepare your sensibilities. So my guest today is Jeff Wiggs, and uh, Jeff, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, what you do? Let's see, right now, um, in my fourth incarnation, I'm a general generalist attorney um, in the Northern California area. I practice in bankruptcy and federal and state civil litigation, as well as trust and estates litigation. Um, prior to that, I was a management consultant, um, again, a solo management consultant. I'm a solo attorney. I was a solo management consultant for two years um, after receiving my MBA from Pepperdine. Um, prior to that, I spent 15 years as a... Uh, a computer programming contractor. Uh, basically traveled around the country programming for wholesale food distribution operations. 
um, in a specialized uh, ERP or um, enterprise resource planning system. Um, while before that was, uh, I spent a lot of time as a night, night computer systems operator working my way through school, and um, part of that was the Air Force. And that's, that's you know there there were things before that you know such as driving an ambulance and being a volunteer fireman, but those are the those are the those are the jobs that actually paid me money. <laughs> wow, that's uh, that's quite a a, a litany. Uh, you have a pretty broad view of the American employment system. Yes, I do, and the education system as well. It's uh, yeah, I, I've I've been around, I guess. So a little bit about uh, your educational experience. You can start wherever you can start. Well, I think I think what stands out is my time in high school in California as a uh, you know in a, in a public public high school in California, you know, trying to uh, squeeze an education out of it. I think I missed, in my senior year, I think in one or two classes, I missed 60 out of 90 days in one semester. Um, I still managed to graduate with a 3.97 GPA, you know, 13th or so in my class of 500. Never learned how to work, never learned how to apply myself. I walked out of high school with a full academic ride to um, the University of Tulsa as a petroleum engineering major, which lasted a grand total of about a month and a half before I realized that I had never learned how to actually do any real work and ne never learned how to actually apply myself academically. I was doomed from the moment I left high school. Huh. That's interesting. Well, you managed to, to do okay for yourself. How did uh, how did you go from that to where you are now? Well, I was hanging around in, in Porterville, um, where we know each other from, basically. And uh, my I think it was my dad asked, meant, told me, you know, had suggested that perhaps I look at the military and you know, I'd never really thought of the military as an option because I was supposed to be one of those smart kids, right? I was supposed to be able to do anything I wanted to. And a year at college had convinced me that I was a, I was kind of an idiot. I I was a I was supposed to be an engineering major. The only classes that I actually enjoyed and and or passed were English, political science, and computer science. At the time, this is back in 1983. At the time, the whole computer science thing, it was very very young in terms of what is, is in, in terms of the scope that it is today and so it never really occurred to me to go and become a computer a computer science major or a computer engineer which i probably could have easily transitioned to at the time if i'd have had you know any level of guidance after that it was the air force where instead of being an x-ray technician and getting to serve out my time in you know medical clinics around the country around the world i ended up in i ended up taking a uh, synthetic language test and they, they discovered that i knew a lot about languages or I say I had a natural tank, talent for languages. So it was off to the Defense Language Institute for a year to learn Vietnamese. Not my language of choice. I actually wanted to learn Arabic and sell my soul to Coca-Cola at the time. Uh, but, you know, the, the, the Vietnamese language program was, was, was brutally tough. But my friends and I, we made it through. And it basically was, a, it was a, an immersion program. I, I did again. I didn't do very well at it. I, I, I really wasn't ready to apply myself at the time. I'd coasted through so much school. I was identified as gifted in grade four, and so I was put in all the gifted classes. Well, being in the gifted classes essentially meant that I could get away without doing any work. I think I wrote my first essay in my freshman year of high school, and was shocked and dismayed to discover that it was graded as an F. Um, I still remember the F on the page. I had never gotten an F before in anything. And because and, and he was right. It, um, it was Tracy Armstrong. I still remember the professor. I actually have his book of poetry on my desk at home. Um, but I had never had to actually do any work at learning. And that woke me up a little bit. But even in high school, those teachers were so few and far between that I didn't have to wake up that much. I just had, I, you know, I could, instead of firing on one cylinder, I had to fire on two out of six cylinders. And you know, that was more than enough to, to cruise through a system that was basically there to warehouse juvenile delinquents so that they weren't walking the streets during the day, I guess. I, I've, I've often you know, jokingly called myself a victim of the California public education system. They, they, were so, they were so overloaded with kids who just didn't want to be there that there was no way for them to teach anyone who had any level of intellectual curiosity. And I wasn't diligent enough or, I guess, I don't know if the word's diligent even, motivated enough to go out and learn it on my own. I, I'm fascinated by learning. I love to learn new things. In fact, being an attorney is the is the favorite, the best job I've ever had. Because every time I start a new case, I get to learn something completely new. Even if it's a case related to something else that I've done over and over and over again, there's very little that is um, 
other than you know a lot of administrative stuff below below the surface, there's very little in law that is cookie cutter. You know, there's a lot of the same forms, a lot of the same situations, but you've got to apply a reasonable level of learning and and discovery to each to each individual case. That wasn't the case in high school. Uh, the, that level of curiosity wasn't rewarded. Conformity was rewarded. Um, being quiet was rewarded. I remember one of the girls in our class, a very nice gal, she was the co-valedictorian, and I don't think she'd ever taken an academic class uh, other than the bare minimum requirements. N not, and that's nothing against her. She just she went to those classes. She got good grades, and she probably had a much more satisfying early, early uh, post-high school education or post-secondary education career or maybe even a happier life but um, than I did after it, it literally took me 10 years to learn that there was there, there was there was a point to it all I guess does that make sense Steve yeah yeah that definitely makes sense so did you start checking out around fourth grade or is that just when you were kind of shifted into the gifted classes about when did you when did you realize that you could kind of get away with stuff and start coasting junior high junior high I realized that I did I took it I remember. I think I remember the class. We had um, biology or zoology with one professor in, at uh, Pioneer Junior High, and he gave us a test at the beginning of the year, and he gave us a test at the end of the year, same test. And I aced the test, which is never a good thing to do. And so I, I, I basically sat back and said, well, and he told us, this is the test you're going to get at the end of the year, too. And I thought to myself, well, I guess I'm kind of done. So, and... And then I started re noticing that I would be in these gifted English classes, gifted you know language classes, and it didn't really matter if I didn't do any work. No one seemed to be all that interested in uh, holding my feet to the fire or expecting any level of performance from me. Um, I was bright. I participated in class. I stayed up on the reading. I did the homework kinda, but I wasn't putting out any effort. I think that what would have made a huge difference, I think, is. Uh, something that I saw my high school friends do, and her senior year, instead of going to high school, she went to she went to junior college. She went over to, to uh, Porterville Junior College, <clears throat> and she took a full load of class there instead of hanging around the high school and marking time until the end of the year. I think that that might have made a huge difference, but no one was pushing me that way. Um, you know, I don't know why. You know, my parents weren't pushing me that way. I didn't even realize it was a possibility till probably mid year. And it seemed like work, so I wasn't going to do it to myself. So I, I kind of I, I did a lot of work avoidance. Consequently, I spent 10 years of post-secondary education getting my undergraduate degree. When I finally graduated with my degree in computer science, I had 170 semester hours. Wow. And, th and that's what it took to finally get a degree in something. It it it, it, it caused its own damage, right? I, I managed to get, I got my bachelor's degree just in time for my 10-year reunion, literally a month and a half prior to my 10-year reunion. So normally at this point in the conversation, I'm asking something about uh, Google and the Internet and you know, how students today can use that to make themselves look smarter. And maybe, maybe that's the right place to bring this up now. We've now got Wikipedia and Bing and Google and lots of places where we can just go look information up. And someone with a reasonably uh, savvy ability to search can come up with just about any answer and it's probably reasonably intelligent as long as there's a little bit of skill behind it and so students can suddenly look like they are 10 to 20 IQ points smarter than they really are in an environment like this what does it mean to be educated now you know I think that's a big challenge it seems to me and, I, and again I don't have any of the experience that the kids have now but any, any relatively competent paraphraser can now take Wikipedia and Google and write an essay on it and I think that it's a sacrifice of information for knowledge, learning. You know, one of my favorite things to do when I was at the University of Nebraska and my computer science degree was to wander through the library and look for the oldest looking book on the shelf, on any given shelf. Um, you know, there's, there wasn't much literature in computer science that made any sense because it, you know, anything older than six months was out of date anyway. So you, you know, why bother? Maybe you, you'd read a couple um, SSG magazines now and then just for fun. If, but they were random learning excursions. And I used to be able to do that on the Internet, I think. Uh, I used to do it a lot more than I do. But it seems now, if, you, if you're giving a student an assignment and you're sending them out to the Internet, they're going out to the Internet to help them accomplish that assignment, 
number one, it's, it's wonderful on one hand because you've got all the information in the world sitting there waiting for you, but you've also got no filter. You've got no way to evaluate how that information is skewed or whose point of view dictates the course of that information. Or And it, and it doesn't even have to be a bias. There, there is an unconscious bias that any publisher of information is going to run across in what they choose to publish. It isn't so much how they choose to speak about what they're publishing, but what did they actually choose to publish? Right? What stories, what stories did they ignore, and what what pieces of information did they ignore, and how many other sources are you, are you going to have to go to to find those pieces of information that were left out because the publisher or journalist producing that piece of information didn't like it, didn't think it was useful, or just didn't agree with it and left it out. And I think we're, before, remember in the old days we'd pick up those, uh, what, what was that index called that had all the magazine articles? Um, all, uh, it was oh, a comprehensive index. Remember yeah. that thing? Yeah, I know what you're talking about. I mean, it was next to the card file or something. <laughs> exactly. There were those big books and they had like quarterly magazines and you could open them up and it would have magazine titles. Oh my God, I cannot convey to you how many times I would pick that thing up find a random article and launch into an entirely new area of discovery for myself, just reading something. And I love to read, so you know, anything, any excuse to find something new to read was all it took. I would just devour anything. But I don't know if you type a bunch of words into the Google search box and you hit enter and it brings you back the information, where is that exploration coming from? You know, where's, you know, you're learning exactly what you need to know, but I don't know that what you needed to know was really the point of the exercise when we were kids, right? The, the point of the exercise was how do you go and learn something? Let's say I, I did a report when I was a kid on the Nez Perce Indians because I had a whole bunch of horsemen's magazines that told the story of Chief Joseph and the Nez Perce Indians and how they ran away from the cavalry and their whole, their whole map and route. And the point of that paper that I wrote on that subject wasn't – to know the history intimately of that particular set of Indian battles or that particular you know, crisis you know, at that time. It was to put all that information together, evaluate it, make a decision about it, come to a conclusion or a judgment on my own, um, see one or two sides of that, maybe even three or four sides of that, and, and ask myself, you know, what, what should have happened, what could have happened, was, this, was it all bad, was it all good? I, did I learn something out of it? Now I would type that in, and someone would direct me to a web page that said, you know, this here's this great Indian leader, and this is these are the things he did, and here's the horrible cavalry after him. It's too easy. Is that does that unnecessarily confuse the issue? No, I don't think so. In fact, I think you're you're kind of heading in the direction of the next question I tend to like to ask people, and that is, you know, given this landscape of you know your experience. What is the purpose of an education looking at all of that? To me, it's to fill time between life and death. You know? You know, what do you do, right? You are born and you start learning stuff. So you keep learning and you keep practicing and you keep discovering new things. At least I do. I've left at least two careers where I was in relatively high demand. When I get bored and I have too much access to a computer system, then I get a little bit dangerous because I can make you know, <laughs> boredom leads to an attention, and attention leads to mistakes. Mistakes lead to large scale businesses closing, people being out of work, people being out of jobs, and me getting sued for malpractice. I have to stay interested. Uh, I don't. I don't understand the mentality of people who can just grind stuff out day after day in a job that they're not interested in. I, I, I often think that my life would be easier if it were. I, you know, certainly would be easier if I could find a good nine to five job or a nine to nine job, right? Wherein I was able to sit down, you know, work a bunch, lo log my hours, um, and leave, and that was all that was really expected of me. I worked at Mutual of Omaha right after getting my computer science degree. I worked there for eh, a little over a year, and I I could have easily just put my head down and just kept working. They were, they were wonderful people, uh, but you know, I, I came into the program right out of a computer science degree, and I was basically teaching them the language and the computer system that they were working on. They, they knew other systems, but they didn't know the one that they were, that they'd been placed on. I did. And you know, it, would have been, it would have been no problem to just to, to stay with that. You guys had been there for 20 plus years, 20, 25, 30 years. Their greatest joy in life was to meet down in the Mutual of Omaha cafeteria at lunch and quiz each other on rules from the golf rule book. 
You know, that they had <laughs> that that was you know that was the part of their job that they liked, and that had nothing to do with their job. You know, th- their job itself, they they just did it. They, they were they were tradesmen, right? They showed up when the bell when the uh, whistle blew, and they went home when the whistle blew. And yeah, they'd put time in if they had to, but by and large, they didn't think about this stuff at home. I wake up at five, four or five o'clock in the morning. And I don't even realize I'm awake. I'm already thinking about my cases. And, I, and I, when I realize I'm awake, I'm usually mad at myself for not sleeping. Because <laughs> I, I don't go to bed until midnight, and I'm up at 4 or 5, um, because my job is pulling me out of my bed and throwing me into my chair and chaining me to my desk every day. And I, I don't know how to do it any other way. So I'm going to back up just a little bit. I think it's interesting. When I asked you about the purpose of an education, that you you didn't – say anything about school, you jumped straight into learning, which isn't necessarily connected to school. It, it can be, but it doesn't have to be, and that's an interesting perspective. Tell me why you immediately jumped to learning as its own activity. You know, I don't know that I saw a lot of value in school, other than once I, it was almost like once I learned how to read, I was kind of self-directed, uh, even from you know the early, my earliest memory. I was reading everything I possibly could get my hands on, and you know that was that's what I, if I had one thing to wish for everybody that they would that they would love to read anything. I mean, if I don't think sitting in a classroom, um, being drilled on names and dates. Oh, well, let me bring this up. I'm a big history buff. So is my wife. Um, we travel to Europe as often as we can, which isn't all that often, but we get there, and. We just we we love we we love to see where these historical things occurred. Now, if I was to rely on the history that I learned in grade school, junior high, and high school, my history would be limited to some stuff about the Magna Carta, maybe the Pilgrims hopping in a boat coming to Jamestown. Not and this is not a sequence, but Columbus sailing around the world, and all, then all these Spanish explorers who sailed around the world and or to America. I'm sorry, Columbus sailing to America um, and and claiming it for Spain. None of the actual tapestry of what 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 occurred during those events ever ever came through because we would get somewhere around the Civil War every year, and then we would stop because that was the end of the year. And then next year, history would start right back up at the same rough time period. And plow right along through until we got around to the Civil War again. And then we'd stop because that was the end of that year. And we did the same damn history year after year after year. Eventually, a little bit about California history and you know, the Spanish, you know, the Spanish selling of you know, the missions, the Spanish, um, the takeover by the, 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 the white settlers, um, maybe a little bit about Vallejo's desperate appeal for settlers or, arm, or um, an army. And, and, but every year it stopped. And then we started again. And because we grew up in Porterville, um, once we started junior high, we started reading Grapes of Wrath and talking about the Okies coming out from Oklahoma <laughs> and, you know, and the, mis- the, you know, the, the, the misery they had to go through. But that was it. You know, so, we didn't talk about much about World War One. I. I, I recently uh, found a podcast on World War One that I've been just devouring. I had no idea of all the little political things that were going on that basically caused the entire world to erupt in flames. So, and then the same thing happening 20 years later in World War II. But I, I never got that from, from school. I took AP history. I passed the AP history test, but I, I, I didn't get much history out of it. So I, I have a question about that. So when exactly was it that you uh, noticed that history was less about facts and dates and more about stories and uh, interpretations? When I was in high school, I took the AP history exam. And... I, well, on the on the AP history exam, there was a big picture of who I now know is John Brown, and the question asked uh, asked us to discuss the northern and southern sides view of the story of John Brown. Now, wonder of wonders, I had never heard of John Brown. I had heard of Harper's Ferry, and I knew that something I vaguely knew that something had occurred there, but I I couldn't have told you who John Brown was. And I I had never seen the picture before. So I commenced, as all good test takers do, to bullshitting. (laughs) And three pages later, lo and behold, I passed an AP history exam, Um, which meant I didn't have to take first semester history in college. And it had nothing to do with the dates. It had nothing to do with the numbers 
that had nothing to do with anything about the details of it. I could I was able to deduce that it was something about the Civil War. There were enough leading questions that it pointed me towards Harper's Ferry, and I talked about it generically in a manner that evidently either pleased or fooled the whatever you know sleepy eyed grader was dealing with my essay. That day. <laughs> To whom I'm eternally grateful as well as eternally uh, sincerely apologetic for having to read my garbage. I remember in in school we would start sometime around 1420, the year 1420, plus or minus, when Degas sailed around uh, the, the Horn of Africa. And we finally found a way to, in, to the Indian Ocean and the, you know, the, how the Portuguese explorers sailed further and further. And... Oddly enough, we never we never knew that they were actually we, we were never taught that they were sailing down there to uh, build the slave trade. So no one ever bothered to mention that. <laughs> so they gave us a bunch of years, which I've all which I've forgotten. And I don't think I ever actually memorized because memorization takes you know, rote memorization takes work. And as I've told you before, I I'm not big on work, I'm not a big fan. At least not that not that kind of work, not that mindless sort of memorization. And every year. We'd get somewhere near the Civil War in in, um, in history class, and then the year would end, and we'd come back and we'd start the whole stupid thing again. Say pretty much the same period of time, maybe a little more detailed because we were older. And then every year we'd get right up to the Civil War again, and then we'd stop. <clears throat> and that was it. That was history. We had this weird sort of 400 year period of time, it basically repeated the same thing. And then when we got to junior high, we we learned about the you know, the Grapes of Wrath period, because we all grew up in Portola, California, where the Grapes of Wrath basically ended. The book ended. Um, and so we learned about that. But we learned, but everything was learned in isolation. You know, nothing about causes. And you know, when I started getting out and visiting some of these places, and I started realizing that the other side had a, the other side had a point of view as well. So you know, in America, we tend to be gross narcissists in terms of everything. All history is either seen or told from our point of view. And I think that's one of the reasons, because we're sitting in these history classes as kids, and everything is taught from an American point of view. And I've, I've learned so much more since then about how other countries viewed us as we were coming up back in the late 1800s, early 1900s, that... You know, we were the upstarts that were taking on Spain and, you know, beginning to project power through our Navy. I don't know. Just It seems like history is taught by partially interested physical ed teachers that neither know nor care about why these events occurred. I guess it's a rambling, rambling answer. I'm not even, not even sure that I addressed your point, but I, my uncle, my uncle Bill, who I love dearly, is a, was a history major. After he got back from Vietnam, he uh, attended college on the GI Bill, uh, majored in history, and then went, went out to teach school. And he's got a real real wry sense of humor. <clears throat> and one day he, he he's talked about he said something about history major, and he, and he goes, "How how dull of a person do you have to be to be a history major?" And he's actually one of the more, more interesting people I know in my family. And I, it was several years before I actually learned that he was a history major. <laughs> But he has a more informed and more mature view of the world, and I think that's what history is supposed to be te- is supposed to be giving us. But the people that teach it seem so disinterested. At least in the high school and junior high, elementary school level, they just seem so disinterested in telling the story. I th- I think that in order to tell the story, in order to understand the stories behind all those dates and numbers, you have to be genuinely interested in it. Otherwise, you never dig below the surface of that. And I don't, I don't think most public school teachers are, are digging that deep. I, and I don't blame them. I mean, they're, they're dealing with a bunch of kids who have no interest at all in being there. Um, their parents aren't enforcing their attendance. They're, they're attending because that's the law and that's what they're supposed to do. They're not there because they want to be. They're there because they have to be. Does that answer that question or is that just no, too I, long? No, I think, I think that answers that question. And I, I think you you've hit it actually the core of probably most or all of the disciplines that are out there. You have to have a genuine interest in the study in order for it to be valuable to you. And I think for us, I mean, we 
at Tabletop Inventing, we spend time thinking about, you know, science, technology, engineering, art, mathematics, and occasionally entrepreneurship. Uh, and not that we're not that history is unimportant, and not that uh, you know some of the other social sciences are unimportant. That just happens to be what we're focusing on. But my experience has been that the students that are putting their hands in the material, that are really experimenting with it, you know, rolling it around in their heads, you know, touching the the electronics and the programming and the uh, 3D design, are the ones that are doing the most learning. You know, and just talking to them doesn't seem to uh, that doesn't seem to pique their interest, and so no real learning seems to happen. And, you know, from the history perspective, what you're talking about, it seems to be the same analogy where the history to you became real and interesting when you started uh, connecting some things that you were genuinely interested to know uh, to uh, dates and ideas and places that before seemed ah, more or less disconnected. Is that and if, you, and if you think about it, it's really easy for for an elementary or grade school or junior high or high school teacher to write a test based on dates, right? Give me the date that, that Ferdinand de Gama sailed around the Horn of Africa. What, what what year did he come back? What year did he leave? When when did Columbus sail across sail across the Atlantic? Those are easy tests to grade, right? You yeah. write the test, get the question down. The student writes one four nine two and for 1492 and you know that he, the student at least paid attention to the text enough to memorize you know that year but when you put that same voyage in the context of why did Ferdinand and Isabella sponsor nominal Italian ostensible Portuguese sailor to during the middle of their prosecution of the Inquisition why did they sponsor his voyage Seeking India when all of the all of the navigators in Europe knew that Columbus wasn't good enough at math to know how big how how to measure the circumference of a globe or a, or, or of a of a of a, ball, of, a of a sphere. You, you know, you look at the 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 desperation for trade, the desperation to get around the stranglehold that Portugal had on trade. Those stories are interesting, right? But th but that's but those stories also involve interpretation and understanding and intellectual curiosity and if you don't have those three factors you're not you're, you're not going to find somebody you're not going to find somebody interested enough to figure all that stuff out and if you only start your history lesson in 14 you know the 1400s you don't really understand that you never talk about how portugal this little tiny country on the lip of spain had a, had a stranglehold and a, a massive empire it's like art teachers who've never been to Europe, who've never been to the Louvre, who've never been to the National Galleries in 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 uh, London. They put pictures of these paintings up, and you say, "Wow, that's a pretty painting." And then you go and you stand in front of it in the Louvre or in you know the National Gallery of London, and you, and the scale and the brightness of the of the of the pigments and the brush strokes the the the, your ability to see the strokes of the brush on the canvas, it brings everything out. It changes everything. It goes from being a sterile picture, even in HD, you know, which is what we see on the web all the time, you know, an HD that would have left our, our ancestors envious. It, it's different when you see it full size, when you see a room devoted to a painting like the Mona Lisa, you know, and the, the crowds of people that gather in front of that painting, it's an event. And the painting itself is so much more interesting than the pictures of that painting. It, the painting itself has a life that those pictures, regardless of their definition, can't bring forward. But you have to have a level of intellectual curiosity to hike to Paris, get into the Louvre, stand in line long enough to see this painting. And then you've also got to have a little bit of a soul to say, wow, that was really amazing. I don't know anything about that painting, but it was amazing. And look at look at the way it looks. Um, you know, I've I've stood in the Sistine Chapel and looked at the you know the restored ceiling, thinking, this is this is amazing. I, there are no words for it. There, we can't describe what that what that ceiling looks like in real words. Uh, we don't we don't have we don't have a vocabulary for it. But if you see it, if and you pass on to the people you're teaching that there is something there that can't be conveyed by either my words or this or this 
video of it or this picture of it, then you spark a level of curiosity. And I, to me, that's the key to education. I've got 170 credit hours because I just kept finding new things that I wanted to learn. I had an advisor yell at me once because I took a C++ class. She said, well, I hope you wanted to learn that because you don't, it's not going to count for your degree. You've already got too many programming languages. Are you kidding me? I've got too many programming languages? I couldn't have enough programming languages. I love programming languages. I, I, I used to collect them like baseball cards um, <laughs> and, and use them and work with them and understand the strengths and weaknesses of them. And but but because those are the languages I was interested in. Computers computers and computer science wasn't just a career path. It was something that I was genuinely interested in, and it sparked a level of intellectual curiosity. And I I, I worry that kids don't get that anymore. They don't because because okay, I'm intellectually curious about X, so I'm going to go to Google and I'm going to search X, and it's going to tell me all I need to know. And because we've we've kind of started treating the internet as this comprehensive, not infallible, but at least comprehensive source, where where's that curiosity going to come from? You know, is an HD picture of is an HD JPEG or GIF or TIFF file of a master's painting the same as seeing it in in gallery? You know, any of the um, the Van Gogh paintings, you know, the, the pictures of those don't do them justice. When you see them hanging on a wall, it's it's a different, it's an experience. It's not just a picture. And I I, I worry that we just we're showing people a lot of pictures. Yeah. If you say much more, I'm going to have to put you on the payroll because everything you're talking about is exactly the things that we keep trying to emphasize. You know, the importance of curiosity, the importance of actually rolling up your sleeves. And, and jumping headfirst into what you're trying to learn, um, it isn't enough just to read a, you know, a description in a textbook. You know, you have to experience the education, whether it is history or art, or science or engineering or you know, computer programming. You have to roll up your sleeves and go do it. There's no substitute. And I, I think if uh, I think if uh, I let you and you let me, we would probably go on with this uh, interview for quite a bit longer. So I'm going to uh, s- cut things short here and just ask you for any final thoughts, and we'll wrap it up. Final thoughts? Wow. You know, education is work. It's hard work to get an education. It's supposed to be. Humans are not instinctual beings, right? We, there's there's so much that we learn on instinct and habit and force of habit, but the things that are that really separate us from the monkeys are basic are things that we're willing to work to go do. We're willing to work to discover. I I I am frequently standing on a soapbox mourning the demise of our space program, because it was a lot of money spent, but it was money spent looking up, and there are people who argue with me saying that th- that money should all be spent on social programs. And I keep thinking to myself, spending it on social programs is spending it all looking down, trying to lift people up, rather than setting a goal out there that, that's greater than all of us and trying to get people to all work in, work towards that goal. We can subsidize social behavior all day long, and it's not going to advance us. But when we subsidize knowledge and education and risk and seeking and striving, then we get a true societal advantage from it. Caring for others is nice, but as a governmental function, I don't think it really advances it advances a republic or a society to do so. Well, you, it's interesting you tied that back to uh, a previous podcast. You didn't know you did that, but uh, uh, a few podcasts back, uh, Linda Poland talked about hearing you know, the declaration that we're going to put a man on the moon. I mean, that that's inspiring. I think in our generation, the equivalent would be to put a space station on Mars, and I don't think it's outside the realm of possibility, but you're right. We, we have to get behind it. We have to look up. You know, We're going to have to get our, our hands dirty, and we're going to have to go give it a shot. Thank you so much, Jeff. I really appreciate your uh, insights here, and I just wanted to thank you so much for taking a few minutes to talk to us and give us a perspective of a, a lawyer, computer programmer, art enthusiast, uh, slash uh, history buff slash probably four or five other things. <laughs> I think academic vagrant is probably. Uh, 
yes. I'll be looking forward perhaps to talking to you more about this in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. It's been a privilege. Thank you. I have always been fascinated by fire. In fact, I started a fire this morning well before sunrise to drive off the chill in the living room. We heat our house with wood, and I love to get a good fire going and watch the flames dance around inside the fireplace. We, when we go camping, one of my favorite times is in the evening after a hard day of hiking or playing or exploring. We light up the fire and talk about the fun we had, the tall tales of childhood exploits, or that time we thought we were a goner. The fire is almost a metaphor. The flames dance in and around the wood weaving the most exquisite patterns, while the stories mirror the intricacy being played out in the campfire. So it will probably not surprise you to know that I played with fireworks as a kid. I grew up in North Carolina, and while not strictly illegal to light fireworks, we had to drive to Tennessee or Georgia to buy them. Needless to say, my parents did not leave fireworks just lying around. I had to work hard to collect them over time. Now, what, pray tell, would a budding young mad scientist need with a fireworks collection? Honestly, when I started collecting them, I probably didn't have a clue what to do other than let's see if we can get them all to go off at once. At the time, we could still get M80s, which were quite spectacular, but because of which, my uncle doesn't have good hearing in one ear and is missing part of a finger. I saved a couple of those, some bottle rockets, black cats, jumping jacks, and a few other assorted incendiaries. And one day, I got a great idea. I could take all the gunpowder out of those fireworks and make my own. Thus started phase two of my crazy plan. I started emptying all the contents of any fireworks collected into an old black plastic 35mm film canister with a gray lid. I think you have to be old, as my kids like to say, to remember those film canisters. But they're about an inch and a half tall and about three quarters of an inch in diameter. And I thought I'd have one filled in no time. Boy, was I disappointed when after emptying a whole pack of black cats, I could barely tell I even put anything in the canister. Bummer. I really needed to step up my collection speed, I, I surmised. Unfortunately, the 4th of July and New Year's only came around once a year each, and no self-respecting pyro can resist lighting a few before pocketing a couple. So needless to say, it took me a year or two to collect enough to fill even a quarter of the film canister. I carried that thing around and showed it off quite a bit, but I didn't ever seem to f but it never seemed to fill up fast enough. Knowing what I know now, I do wonder what sort of oxidizers and other unstable chemicals go into fireworks. It might even have been quite dangerous to carry all that around for so long. I'll have to ask my friend Chris about that. Well, boys are impatient creatures, and one day I just couldn't stand it any longer. I had to find out what would happen if I lit that whole thing up at once. I still only had about a quarter to a third of the canister full, and as I looked on, I imagined what a huge explosion would make. So, without any onlookers, not even my brother who always seemed to be nearby, I took my film canister out to the driveway, and I set it down on a railroad tie by my mom's flower bed. Then came a dilemma. How exactly does one light that much explosive? I didn't have any wicks left over because my mad search because in my mad search for more I even emptied the tiny amounts of powder from the wicks. I finally decided on dropping a match into the open film canister and jumping quickly back. Fantastic plan in the mind of a 10-year-old. The results were spectacular. I still remember the immediate flash and the giant blue flame leaping 2 or 3 feet straight up into the air. It wasn't like a blooming flower as it spread, it was more like a leaping dagger, thin and long. Leaping back notwithstanding, I still singed a little hair in my escape. I stood there dumbfounded for a moment, and then did the triumphant YES! exclamation of any ten-year-old who just conquered the world. And after my victory dance, I realized it was over. The only remnants were a twisted, melted film canister and a great story. At this point, you are no doubt wondering about the morals of this story. I'm not advocating letting kids in California collect fireworks and lighting up an inferno to incinerate their parents' house or most of Southern California after a particularly dry summer. I mean, every year we worry about a forest fire burning down our house here in the oh-so-dry desert. 
We've even had a couple of close calls, one of which was started by a couple of boys playing with fireworks. So what does this story have to tell us? In Jeff's experience, he shared with us an idea that hasn't come up in our podcast yet. And that is that all of life is an education. We get to learn something new every day if we choose. Sometimes we learn what not to do. For instance, collecting incendiary powder in a film canister probably isn't particularly wise. And sometimes we get penetrating insights from the simplest experiences. There is just so much to learn. Life is chock full of lessons. However, we'll never learn new things if we never expose ourselves to new experiences. Perhaps be a little more choosy about the new experiences than a 10-year-old pyromaniac, but keep looking for those things around that can illuminate the world. From that experience of collecting powders from the fireworks, I learned very early the power of chemical reactions. And later on, when I took physics in college, I gained an even greater respect for the power of nuclear reactions. However, I would have to point back to the early tangible experiences as a major shaping influence on my respect for chemical reactions and for the laws of physics. For you, it may be staring deeply into a flower, getting down on your hands and knees in the desert to look at the sand, or closing your eyes in the forest just to listen. A wealth of experience is in our surroundings and is waiting to teach us if we'll just take the time to notice it. So today's great inventor secret, take time to observe, reflect, and learn from the world around you. Have you been enjoying the Tabletop Inventing Podcast? Have comments or questions you'd like us to address? Contact us and we'll think through the comments and answer your questions here in the podcast. And be sure to let us know if you'd like a shout out or to remain anonymous. You can share your comments and questions at www.ttinvent.com slash podcast or by emailing us at podcast at ttinvent.com. Let's discuss your thoughts and questions. Join us again next time when we will again seek to answer the question, what is the purpose of an education? And as educators, how do we awaken the inventor in each of our students? Mm -hmm.